Hello, welcome everyone to this month's uh, Node Investing webinar. I conduct these meetings uh, once a month. My name is Srikant Kandla. You can call me Sri. Uh, welcome to the group. If somebody who has joined recently, we talk everything related to Node Investing and um, share my experiences, either you're buying uh, bank paper or seller finance paper, whether you're buying uh, performing or non-performing, um, I'm going to discuss uh, all the different type of notes that I buy, what are the challenges that we uh, we face in the business on a day-to-day -day basis, how do we overcome, adapt, and uh, grow. So to start off with, let me give you a little background about myself. Um, Um, uh, I started in 2008 as a real estate investor. Uh, before that, you know, uh, my husband, father for two sons, sorry, father for two kids, daughter uh, and a son. My son is 10, daughter is four years old. Uh, that's what makes me get up in the morning and do what I do and be there for them. Okay, let me see. I want to confirm that you guys can actually see me. Can uh, someone comment and confirm that I can actually see me or hear me? Can anyone confirm that they can actually see the screen? Okay. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sri Gandla. I've been conducting this meeting for a little over two years now. I used to conduct these meetings uh, once a month, uh, once in Virginia and once in Maryland. Uh, generally, we conduct the third Thursday or third Saturday of every month. We discuss topics related to note investing. And um, I've been investing in notes starting 2011. I used to do mostly sell my rentals with owner financing to prospective buyers. Uh, that's what I used to do until 2014. That's when um, starting 2014, I started buying non-performing notes. I started buying non-performing seconds and then um, started buying non-performing first as well. Um, so that's a little bit about myself and uh, coming to uh, at, back in 2008, I got started as a real estate investor in Baltimore City and Baltimore County, uh, started up buying rentals, then uh, flip properties, flip fee properties, did lease option, um, as I told you in 2011, I sold my some of my rentals as owner financed properties with me financing the property instead of a bank uh, to basically avoid the five T's, I guess. The five T's are tenants, toilets, trash, turnover, and termites. And um, be the bank and hold the paper, be the lien holder, collect the monthly payments without worrying about any repairs or maintenance. You know, that's how I got started. Um, so let's go ahead. So if you want to contact me, here's my contact information. Um, Fairworth Investments is one of my firms. That is the Facebook group that you guys are on. So you already have that info. That's my website, my phone number. Uh, you can contact me if you need any help. As far as node investing is concerned, I will share any way that I can help for no charge. 
but uh, use my use me as a resource that is uh, really valuable for you. So use um, judicially and don't abuse. Okay. All right, disclaimer, this is not an offer to sell a security nor a solicitation of an offer to purchase a security. An offer to sell securities may be made only to qualified prospective investors through offering documents that contain a more complete disclosure of relevant information. This meeting that is being conducted is not being conducted to um, raise any money or to purchase a security. Those are done on a different platform, and this is not the platform for that. And I'm also not offering any legal investment or tax advice. All I'm sharing is what, uh, how it has worked for me, what are the challenges that I faced, how did I overcome, and if you put in the work, this may work for you. Okay. With that out of the way, um, let's start with some basic definitions, right? Basic definition, node investing. What is node investing? How is it different from real estate investing? In a real estate investing, when you buy a real property, you become the owner of the property. And if you have a loan, you're paying to the bank. You are paying your lender monthly payment or however you have structured the payment to be made. You're making a payment to the bank until you own the property free and clear. Well, free and clear is from a from how you look at it, right? It's never free and clear because you still owe taxes every year. But in either case, um, so real estate investor, you own the property in node investing, you don't own the property. You own the loan on the property. You have a lien on the property. Uh, so you you should be paid before they can sell the, the owner can sell the property. You need to be paid off, right? So whenever you do that, or whenever you create a note, or whenever you purchase a note, there are two documents that are very important that you should be aware of. The two documents are note, and a mortgage. Note is a promissory note, which actually it's an IOU that actually lists out um, how the borrower, what is the agreement that the borrower, how is he going to make the payment back? With what is the interest rate and if it's late, um, what is the late fees and how long is he required to pay the loan back? You know, how long is it going to take? Is it 20 years, 30 years, 10 years, five years, one year, six months, whatever might be the case. That is what is listed in the note. Note basically talks about payback terms, basically, right? And uh, all real estate note investing are collateral based. What does it mean? So there is a recourse if the borrower does not pay back. So if the borrower does not make the payment, you as the lender as the option to actually foreclose on the property and take back the property or sell the property and recoup your losses. Right. So the document that actually collateralizes the property uh, is the mortgage or deed of trust. So the mortgage and deed of trust are recorded in the county um, to uh, to record basically saying that I have a lien against this property. I'm the lender on this property and this property before the ownership can be changed. This loan needs to be paid off. Is it always true? In most instances. In some instances, there are exceptions where uh, people can actually transfer the property with a quick claim deed, but that doesn't cure the lien on the property. The lien still stays. The lien is not wiped out. It is still active. And uh, the bar, the lender, as a lender, you still have the option to foreclose on the property. And if any of the conditions listed in the note are not adhered to, you have the option to foreclose. So always look at what are the terms and conditions in the mortgage or the deed of trust if you are in a you know trustee state, right? So there are two types of states. Uh, the whole country is divided into uh, mortgage state and deed of trust. Um, mortgage state, uh, especially from a non-performing world, mortgage state means you have to go to the court to get a judgment to actually be able to foreclose on the property foreclose on the borrower and take back the property. In a deed of trust state, the process is a little different. You don't have to go to a court. It could be a court proceeding if the borrower contests that the mortgage is not valid or the unpaid principal balance is not valid, they can take you to court. Then it becomes a legal judicial process. So basically, you know, it can become a judicial process, but um, essentially, uh, 
you know, non-judicial means most of the time you don't have to go to court. You can actually foreclose by publishing the notice of intent to foreclose, uh, trustee sale, trustee sale in the newspaper for a certain number of days, and then you can actually go to the courthouse steps and foreclose on the property by following the due legal procedure. All right, that is the gist of. Um, let me open one more slide so I can provide you more info on the, some of the other definitions that we have. Bear with me for a second. All right, uh, let's cover some more definitions. We talked about we talked about a note and a mortgage, and the deed is a written document which actually transfers the title or an interest in real property to another person. So that is the deed. Uh, deed is also recorded in the county. Mortgage is also recorded in the county. As a homeowner or anyone who owns a home, home or investment property, you know there are four components to your monthly payment which is principal interest, tax, and insurance. Uh, all four are required to be paid unless you don't have a mortgage. If you don't have a mortgage, principal and interest, you don't need to pay because it's fully paid off. However, you still need to pay taxes, and hopefully you have an insurance on the property to protect your investment. And uh, assignment of mortgage. So when a property is sold, the deed gets transferred from the seller to the uh, buyer's name. Same way, when you buy a mortgage, the assignment of mortgage, a mortgage gets transferred from a, a earlier owner, earlier lender to the new lender. So as mortgage is recorded in the county, assignment of mortgage also gets recorded in the county. If it's a mortgage, then you record an assignment of mortgage. If it's a deed of trust, you just record an assignment of deed of trust. A launch, a launch goes with the note. Uh, the note is written by the original lender who lent out the money. You as a buyer of the debt, you become the lender now, so that your right to collect on the note and uh, also collect the interest, late fees, and how long you're, um, you, are, you have the right to collect on the uh, principal and interest, which is the term that is also listed, uh, that also carries over to you via a launch. Sometimes you'll see something called note endorsement. Uh, when you have a note endorsement, uh, it is similar to note allongement. Uh, basically, you're endorsing the right to collect from um, the seller when he signs the note endorsement. Basically, he's transferring the right to collect on the note uh, from themselves to the new buyer. So those are some of the definitions. And next, some of the terms that you will hear is original unpaid principal balance, as the title suggests. It's, it's basically the unpaid principal balance that was lent out at the beginning of the loan. This is the total amount that was lent to the borrower. Current unpaid principal balance, as time goes along, the borrower made some payments. So uh, some of the payments, um, uh, as long as it is an amortizing loan, they are paid some towards the principal, some towards the, some amount towards the interest. So current unpaid balance, could be lower than the original unpaid principal balance. And in some instances, it could be higher. The instance of where it could be higher is when there was a loan modification that was done in the past. So the loan was originated in, for example, 2005, and the borrower stopped making, making payments in 2010. And 2015, you bought the loan, and that by that time, uh, the deferred balance is, you know, deferred balance plus the current unpaid principal balance is when you combine them both is more than the original principal balance. So you'll see some of the modified loans where the balance, total balance is higher than the original balance. Right? That is because there was a modification that was done in the past, in the past after the origination. Payoff. Uh, payoff is total amount required to pay off the loan completely. That includes the current UPB, accrued interest, late fees, legal fees that are recoverable. When you add all of them up, is payoff, you can calculate the payoff, right? So those are some of the definitions. Uh, let me check real quick 
if anyone has any questions. If not, we'll keep going. Okay. Kirby, welcome. Uh, can you please confirm that you can actually see my screen? There seems to be some uh, type in the chat, or I can add you to the stream if you'd like. Kirby, can you confirm that you can actually see my screen and are able to hear me? I can see you, great. Cannot see the slides. OK. Uh, let me share my. How about now? Can you see the slides now? All right, let's keep going. So the topic of the discussion um, for today's discussion is, what do you need to, um, um, what do you want to choose, active or passive investing, right? Um, right, so one of the reason is, um, I'm not going to use the big words like preservation of wealth, all of that, right? So I'm, 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 what I'm trying to do is talk something really common sense, right? One thing we know for sure is um, the inflation keeps going up, right? Inflation is nothing but if you have $100, what you can buy into 2010, you cannot buy the same amount of required goods today in 2021. The reason being the, uh, the part, goods and services that you need to live are actually, the price of that has gone up. There's nothing but inflation. Right, so here's a, um, there are two inflation indexes that you want to look at. One is what the government says the inf inflation is and what is the actual inflation. So if you look at this chart that I'm showing, I don't want to get too technical on it, but I, I just do make, want to make a point so that um, you understand how the inflation is impacting us, right? So the inflation, um, which is, you know, which is an index, how they measure it is basically they look at all the basic required commodities that we need, like you know milk, gas, sugar, um, you know electricity, all of that stuff, right? Basic needs that you need. And if that goes up, basically housing also housing is also included in that. Once that goes up, what they do is um, they say that the inflation has grown. So what they do is uh, to make sure that the inflation does not reflect the actual uh, numbers. They take out some of the items uh, that were on the index in the past. So if you look at here, right, uh, the chart that you see in the uh, orange and yellow on the bottom, right, this is the official index. So what happened is, um, as the years went by, to show that the inflation is actually less than what it is, they have cert taken certain necessary commodities from the uh, inflation index. So what that does is it shows that the inflation is actually less, right? Inflection is really low, not that high. And um, we have to you know, increase the inflation, basically inflation increase. They're related to more productivity, uh, economy growth, and all of that, right? So if you look at the actual inflation right now, according to the official figures, uh, as published by the Fed, is 45 or 5%. Whereas actual inflation is about eight percent right now, All right? That's in 2021, and uh, there's an interesting website, uh, shadowstats.com. You can go to shadowstats.com and look at what the actual inflation is if you want to um, get geeky. And um, there are different all different kinds of charts there. You can go in there and look at all the charts and see um, 
you know how the inflation actually impacts your savings so you always want to grow your money um, to beat inflation right so moving on so how do you do that right so there are different options you can invest in uh, uh, stocks bonds uh, you can invest in mutual funds uh, but as I told you one of the things that I liked about uh, we talked about mortgage and note right what does a mortgage do it is actually collateralizing a property so you have a real asset that is backing your um, loan amount or the investment amount in this case if you have invested to buy a loan by a note that somebody else has uh, originated or you give out a loan basically there is a hard asset so there's a recourse basically in stocks if the borrower doesn't if the the company that you invested in it does not make money that you don't have any collateral backing it basically it's your belief in the company will keep growing and will give you a good return that is a, that is based on hope right i plan to do um a little bit more secure wherein i want a collateral behind it right that's why i chose node investing so node investing is backed by collateral so because you always get a mortgage or deed of trust depending on the state along with the note so you know there is a hard collateral backing the your money right so uh, that's all good uh, you might ask sri how do i get started you know how do i get started um so first thing you want to decide is whether you want to be an active or a passive investor right what is an active investor what is a passive investor let's talk about active being an active investor active investor let's suppose you are a um, uh, rehabber you buy properties fix them up and sell them right you sell them once if you sell them within 12 months you have uh, capital gains tax you have to pay i know there are other ways you know investing in your sub director IRA and all, all that kind of stuff but there's only up to a limit because the amount of money that you've accumulated in your sub director IRA is limited to an extent depending on how long you've been putting money in there right and depending upon where you live especially if you're living anywhere in the dmv region which i belong to which is dc dc um, maryland virginia uh, if you have below fifty thousand, the amount of uh, properties that you can invest in fifty thousand, unless you want to go for a where you have direct control, in the sense that you know you have the ownership of the property, with fifty thousand is going to be really hard to find one. Right? You can uh, take loans, but there are not many banks that actually lend out where the owner is an IRA. Uh, there are some banks that do that. Um, if anyone is interested and in know about that, shoot me a message. I'll I'll provide that info. Other way to do it is you rehab the property and you owner finance the property. Why am I telling to uh, telling about owner financing? Uh, what you want to look at is um, you want to look at preserving your capital as well as growing it. If you do a flip, uh, the cash that you generate, you have to uh, pay capital gain taxes on that. Um, unless you have a other way to actually, I'm not a tax or a legal professional, so take your legal counsel advice but uh, if you were, were to gain a profit within the first 12 months of your investment you have to pay a certain amount as taxes right so uh, instead of that what you could do is if you want to make this as an income source for the next 20 years or 30 years what you could do is you can own a finance the property right and then you become the bank you find the uh, you find the borrower who is qualified right and um, depending upon if the borrower is going to occupy the home as a homeowner, how your structure is going to vary a little bit. If you are using, if you're going to sell the property with owner financing to a homeowner, uh, my sage advice is use an RMLO that is licensed in that state. Again, if you need information on that, uh, I am me, I can put you in touch with. There are some originators that are licensed in um, all the 50 states or whatever state that you're interested in and uh, use them it's not really costly and you can actually charge the borrower to pay that fees right uh, do it the right way um, you can get away by doing one or two deals a year but i'm talking about if you want to make a business out of it so what you want to do is you want to um, use an rmlo which is a, a residential mortgage loan originator uh, you uh, there are people who provide that service they charge it 
use them to qualify the borrower and then um, originate the loan and then you become the bank and always board the loan with the servicer uh, it is a third party you think of them as a property manager where they will collect the payment they will take out their fees and then ACH the remaining payment to you right you can do that that is one way of but this is a very active business you know you are acquiring the property um, you know if you can't if you don't need to do any repairs that's great um, at least acquiring the property and doing the due diligence is a very active business right and um, finding a borrower that is actually qualified although you have people that will qualify but prospecting for the borrowers and um, prospecting for the buyers is still your responsibility or your if you have a team it's your team's responsibility so uh, that is uh, you know creating your own notes with seller financing and being an active note investor the other way to do it is buy non-performing notes and uh, work out the notes work out the notes is you basically do uh, do a loan modification adjust the payment of the um, borrower adjust the interest rate increase the term or any any combination of this and do a loan modification and get the borrower to pay again uh, obviously your return in uh, non-performing notes is going to be higher if you know what you're doing uh, they're going to be much higher than active note investing i mean uh, creating your own notes or buying performing notes and buying non-performing notes your yield is going to be higher but the work is also more the risk is also more right as long as you have your risk mitigation strategies in place you'll be fine so loan modification is uh, modify the loan we talked about this and if if you and borrower you as a lender and the borrower are not able to come to terms on modification terms and they say they don't have any money to pay or they're not paying enough to cover your payment um, or if they're not willing to talk to you you'll be forced to foreclose on the property right and uh, rent the property foreclose and rent the property you became an active real estate investor at that point of time when you foreclose um, depends on which position you are you basically you become a landlord um, but you know basically you foreclose and rent the property to collect the monthly rent hopefully there is enough to um, get the positive cash flow to make it your worth right and the other part other way you can do it is you can actually foreclose and sell the property retail assuming the property is still in a condition that can be sold for re in retail um, you can foreclose and actually sell the property using a realtor or you know just as the first option where i talked about creating your own notes by selling a property that you have rehabbed you can foreclose and sell the property with owner financing right all of these are active ways of investing in notes to generate income now income into the future right and there are different ways you can capitalize so let's suppose you have 100k you bought a property or you bought a few notes and uh, you exited through one of the scenarios so if you do a loan modification obviously the initial principal that you put in is into the loan so how do how do i actually do the next deal right there are different ways you can do that um, you can use the uh, once the borrower starts making payments that is a iou so basically you are receiving a stream of income so you can put that note as a collateral and borrow against the borrow against the note uh, to actually go and invest again you may not get the full payment but the loan a percentage of the loan amount you can still borrow against it um, same thing when you rent right when you foreclose and rent you become the owner of the property so you can borrow against the property because basically uh, there are no liens against the property uh, because you become the owner now Selling retail, you don't have to worry about the, uh, not having enough funds to actually go ahead and do the next deal because you have foreclosed and you have the funds with you. And the same thing as um, you know, holding the note. If you sell with seller financing, you can use that as a collateral. You can you could sell a partial, partial in the sense if the loan is 30 years long, borrower has paid for one year, 29 years of payments are left. You can sell for the next five years. You can sell the next five years of payments to somebody, and actually get a chunk of cash right now. So starting sixth year, you again start getting seventh year. You'll start getting payments again, but for the next five years, you can sell it to somebody else. All right? I have tried. I have done all of this. All this loan modification, foreclose and rent the property, foreclose and sell the property retail, and foreclose and sell the property with 
seller financing. Only caution of advice is when you do seller financing, make sure that you use an RMLO. Okay, this is active investing. Any questions on active investing before we jump on to um, passive? What's going on? Guys, you can ask any questions that you have. What happens if you sell five years of payments and they stop paying? Uh, good question. So they can, if they stop paying, it depends on the agreement that you have with your buyer, right? Let's suppose, Louis, I'm, I modified a loan and um, one year of payments are received. So the next five years is between, I sold the next five years to you, Louis. So the second year they made the payment and the third year they stopped making payments. At that point of time, it depends on the agreement, how it is written, who is responsible to handle the um, foreclosure or how to make the loan current again. What I do is when I sell my partials or when I sell my notes as a whole, uh, when I sell performing notes or re-performing notes, re-performing notes is nothing but the, where the borrower is making payments. I give a warranty that for the next one year, if the borrower stops making payments, I will buy the note uh, at the price that I sold you minus the payments that, any payments that you have received from the borrower. So you're going to get back the, you know, or if you want to swap with a different note, even that option is available. So what, if you are not an experienced investor where you have done foreclosures in the past as a lender, then uh, I would definitely suggest that in the agreement, you make sure that you have a clause where it says that if the loan goes non-performing, what are the terms? The seller has to deal with the foreclosure by, with you paying the foreclosure costs or you splitting, the, it, all options are on the table. You have to, uh, you, that is up to discussion and agreeing to a term where that works for both parties, basically. But as a principle, um, I generally uh, give one year warranty whether I sell a partial or a full note that if the borrower stops paying within the 12 months after I, after you buy from me, I will, um, no charge to you, I'll, I'll buy back the loan minus the payments that you received and uh, I'll take over the loan uh, and exchange a different note if you want or you know I'll just buy back the loan. Does that answer your question? Uh, if anyone wants to join the stream and ask questions, uh, please let me know. I can uh, make them uh, join the stream and uh, you can ask the questions in live. We, I mean, we'll have some time in the end. If you want to ask more questions, you're welcome to do that. Let's go to the, so anyone has any questions about the active investing part? No questions, great, okay. All right, let's move on to the act, uh, now the passive investing part, right? So this is where um, you have a job and you don't have time to actually um, do this full time because it is a business and you need to spend time to actually uh, make this work and become a source of income for you, right? So passive income, right? Uh, what you can do is, as I was just talking about, uh, you need to decide what is the yield that you want? What is the rate of return that you want that justifies uh, your investment? Right? You're a passive, uh, passive investor. You know, I have anywhere from ranging from six to eight percent return that I provide to my investors. Uh, one of the things, the due diligence that you do when you buy a non-performing note, you want to do the same due diligence for a performing note. What does that mean? So when I buy a seasoned owner finance note, hold for cash flow. So basically, you know, the note rate is 10%, and um, you want 8%. So you you pay a price according to that. Let's do an example, right? So how do you buy a note? So we are buying a note. Uh, with a loan balance of $100,000, right? 
by the way, this is the T-value software that I use in my business. Uh, it lets me calculate really quick and actually provides reports and that kind of stuff. So let's suppose uh, we are giving out this loan on 1st of July. Right, and the first payment is due on August 1st, 2021. And uh, $100,000 is the loan amount, 10% is the interest rate. And uh, let's say the loan term is 30 years, which is 360 months. And we calculate what is the monthly payment going to be. Right. So what you want to do is always the first thing, um, if you notice what I've written over here is uh, it has to be seasoned. What does season mean? Seasoned is not uh, salt and spices. <laughs> uh, seasoned is where they have made consistent payments for a period of time. Generally, you want to look for anywhere from six to 12 months of consistent payments. And how you verify that they have made the consistent payments is not by their bank statement or oh, I have some note uh, sellers actually telling me that they wanted to show me their PayPal statement that they have received the payments. You don't want to do that, right? What you want to do is um, those payments should have been received by a third party servicer that is licensed in that state. It is all hunky-dory and works fine uh, as long as the borrower is paying. But when the borrower stops paying, and if you need to go to the court to actually start the enforcement of foreclosure, that's when all these things come up. So um, if you have a note where the borrower is, uh, the owner of the note is servicing the note, self-servicing, basically they're taking the cash and putting it in the bank, and they're not using a third-party servicer to actually manage those notes, uh, I would definitely buy it at a discount. I would not buy this, pay the same price um, as a note with the similar numbers that is being managed by a servicer. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to make sure that the note is um, serviced by a third party servicer that is licensed in that state. Um, just like anything else, verify with other investors if that servicer is actually uh, licensed in that state. Uh, there are some uh, well-known servicing companies, I'm not going to name them, they've been servicing in some states uh, which they are not actually licensed in. Um, so be careful which servicer do you choose and check with your fellow investors before you choose an um, servicer. So uh, so buy a seasoned owner finance notes and hold for cash flow. So coming to our example, right? So this is at the beginning of the loan and now they are made uh, to uh, you know one year of payment, which is 12 months, right? So at that point of time, if we want to know how much of the principal has actually go gone down. So you know 360 minus 12 is 348. And you want to know what is the uh, unpaid principal balance after one year of payments. So the one year after one year of payments, um, 99,443 dollars and 96 cents is the balance left so you are buying this right you are buying this 99,443 um, at you know whatever interest rate that you want to buy it so um, next again is buying season repo farming loans so what does repo farming mean repo farming is the bar was not paying in the past now they started paying again again so what you want to look at when you're buying repo farming loans is um, what is LTV? LTV is loan to value. The property is worth $100,000. Um, how much equity does the borrower have? You never want to buy 100%, uh, right? If the $100,000 is the property value and the note is also $100,000, you definitely don't want to buy it at a high price if it is at um, f there's no equity left in the property. You need to have some, the borrower needs to have some skin in the game. If not, you're buying the loan at a discount. Right, and uh, guys, if you have any questions about what I'm talking about, please type, in it, type it in. I'll check every often to go back and see if you have any comments and I'll try to answer that. Uh, Pre-performing loans is basically you can hold for cash, right? So um, in my example that I was talking about earlier, I bought a note and um, I, it was a non-performing note. I bought it, I made it re-performing again and the borrower has been making payments. And we have more than one year payments, one year of payments. So it's definitely categorized as a reperforming loan. And you can buy that and hold for cash flow. So you get, you know, 10%, 8%, whatever that is 
um, cash flow on an ongoing basis until the loan is fully paid off, right? That is uh, the the main term to look for in the first two bullet points over here is seasoned and cash flow, right? Uh, you want to make sure that when you buy performing notes, they have enough seasoning uh, on the note, wherein the borrower has made some payments, at least a consistent payments and Reperforming, everyone has a different definition. My definition of reperforming is they are made payments for six months on a consistent basis. That is, they are made payment every month. Uh, six months does not mean they made one month of payment and they skipped two months and the fourth month they caught up where they made all uh, missed two payments plus the current month, three months. So that is not reperforming according to me. According to me, reperforming is they are making consistent payments as agreed in the note or the loan modification agreement every month. That's what is considered as reperforming. So you want to make sure from the servicer records that they are made payments every month and that is reperforming, right? Um, okay, let me see if anyone has any questions before I keep moving on. Okay. Right. Um, if you want to ask any questions, you're welcome to. I've added you to the stream. I muted you, but type it in if you want to ask any questions, I will bring you on. Next one is, if you are short on capital, what do you do? If you are short on capital, you can buy a part of the loan. Uh, in the example, I told you the balance was a little over 99,000. You don't have 99,000. You tell me, hey, I want to earn an 8% return, but I don't have the capital to buy the whole loan. You can buy the partial. Let's suppose you only have 25,000. What you could do is you buy the payment for the next five years. You don't buy the, I mean, depending upon the yield, that number will change. So you buy a part of the note. So this is where it helps if you are somebody who's living in, one of the high priced areas where, you know, like DC Metro or California, well, I guess the whole country has <laughs> became high priced uh, since the past six months. But in any case, um, if you want to buy uh, a reperforming loan and you only have 50,000 or 20,000 loan, $20,000, and if you want to buy, if you want own cash flow, then what you could do is you can buy a partial. You can buy a partial, and after the five years, then you reinvest the money to buy one more partial or you become sophisticated enough, you could buy loans, raise money, and actually buy loans. Um, it, it all depends on the individual, how much work they put in. But having short, being short on capital should not stop you from uh, buying notes. If you don't have the capital even to buy a partial, then start saving money based on from your job or whatever might be the case, right? Um, do whatever it takes, any legal means it takes to come up with some capital. You can get started with 10,000, 15,000 to buy a partial. It's not difficult. You just need to put in the work. More important thing is try to learn how to do it, right? And where do you where do you um, learn how to analyze some of the deals? I can send you some of your deals as long as you sign, sign up the sign the NDA, non-disclosure agreement. I can send you the notes that I have in my portfolio. You can look at it and learn um, how to do the due diligence, right? And there are other sources too. Uh, there are trading platforms where you can actually go and look at the notes, they are performing notes that you have and do the proper due diligence. Um, you want to, when you're buying a note, you want to make sure that the payment history is accurate, right? And you want to make sure that the, the property value is what the seller is claiming to be. The seller claims that the property is $100,000. The loan is $70,000. You think the LTV is good. It's 70% loan to value. Great. But uh, that is only great as long as you confirm the value of the property is actually $100,000. If the value of the property is $60,000, you are above 100% LTV. So you want to make sure that the property value is accurate. And the mortgage and note, uh, initially when you before you actually transfer the funds, you want to make sure you look at the soft collateral. Soft collateral is nothing but a scanned copy of the mortgage and note. And you also want to make sure that uh, if you're buying a first position note, you are in the first position, 
right? And uh, look at if there are any property taxes due that were not paid. You want to look at all of that, right? Um, yeah, the, uh, if you go back and look at some of the uh, webinars that I've done in the Facebook group, you'll find the due diligence webinar that covers in detail, gory details, how you should be doing due diligence. All right, on a performing note and a non-performing note. Uh, it's uh, pretty much the similar except for the servicing history. Go back and look at it and you'll get the information that you need. And if you have any questions, uh, please uh, DM me and I have my, I'll put up my contact info. You can uh, contact me and I can provide you, um, you know, based on my time availability, I can provide you any help that you need. There are actually tons of investors in this Facebook group. We have about 2,200 members in this group and both uh, within the country, outside the country, um, a lot of people message me and get info for free. But, you know, be respectful of my time. So do your part. And then if you're stuck, then reach out to me. And uh, if I can, I will help you. Or uh, what you could do is I have some investors who are, um, who just want a preferred rate of return. They say, I don't want to deal with the collateral. I don't want to deal with the foreclosure attorneys, uh, state regulations, which are changing on a constant basis. I just want a good return, right? So as I told you, depending upon the amount invested, I have six to eight percent that I give to my investors, and they get a preferred return like clockwork. Um, right? That's one option. I'm not saying invest with me. Uh, just do your due diligence uh, you know, about whoever you invest with, and uh, check with uh, um, you know colleagues in the industry, and verify that the person is legit and uh, basically not uh, he has not uh, done something that he told he would do in the past he or she, and then invest with them. I'd get a preferred rate of return. Um, you know, make sure you check your contracts and everything with your attorney or your legal uh, advisor, whoever that is. The other way to do is, um, this is basically being a hard money lender, um, lend out the money to rehabbers. So somebody is an experienced rehabber, uh, they have too many projects going on right now, so they don't have enough capital. Uh, so they want you to lend the money to actually buy the property and fix up and they will pay you. This will be short-term notes, wherein uh, you are generally paid off in a year to two years max. Um, yeah, mostly, most of the time it's interest-only loans. So they only pay the interest, they pay the principal back at the end of the term. On a monthly basis, they're just paying the interest. You could do that as well. And uh, make sure that you have the right paperwork if you're doing this, All right? And, uh, it's not a disadvantage, but if you want to consider it as a disadvantage, you can consider it as a disadvantage. That is, lend out the money for rehabbers. If the rehabber is not able to finish the project, that's the reason you want only want to lend who have done enough rehab projects. I would say at least five to 10 projects, right? Unless you are an experienced rehabber yourself. If you, have, if you are an experienced rehabber and you have the funds, and if they are not able to complete the project, you can take over the property from them and fix it up and sell or rent yourself, right? Um, be a landlord yourself, or you know, do any of the stuff like seller financing, other stuff. Then you can lend the money out. But if not the case, that is not the case. Then you want to make sure that um, you only lend to people who have enough experience rehabbing the properties, right? And you have the pay right paperwork. Hire a uh, competent attorney who is knowledgeable and have written contracts for hard money loans in the past and uh, employ them to do the paperwork for you and make sure that um, the note is collateralized wherein if they don't pay you get the property you want to make sure that is written up correctly um, okay this is uh, i was talking about the collateral due diligence when you buy seasoned owner finance notes or institutional reperforming and hold for cash flow uh, this is for getting cash flow from the notes. Uh, collateral due diligence. You want to make sure that the lien is secured. Uh, property is not sold in tax sale. So just so you know, lien priority, there is something called lien priority. Lien priority is uh, who has the first right on the property. As you might think as an owner, you might have the first right of the property. You do not. The first right on the property is always the county. Why do I say that? If you don't pay taxes, the county can sell your property. 
right? Although it's free and clear, they can still sell the property, right? So the county has the first um, first priority. The second priority is if you have any loans on the property, then the lender which has a loan on the property has the second right on the property, right? If you are buying a first loan, you want to make sure that other than the well, you want to make sure that the taxes are current, right? Taxes are current in the sense they are paid taxes on time. There are no delinquent taxes. And the best way to find out uh, whether the taxes are current is not looking at the county website. You want to actually call the county and ask them, are the taxes paid? And if they are paid, you want to make sure that it was this paid by somebody else other than the owner of the property. Generally, what happens is when a property goes to a tax sale, um, depending upon the state and the county, uh, the taxes, when the tax certificate is sold, the proceeds that are received by the county from the tax sale, tax lien sale, um, or tax deed sale, those funds are used to pay the taxes. Then the amount of taxes owed will show that the tax is zero. That doesn't mean it is zero, uh, but it's just that a tax lien buyer has paid the taxes. So what you want to ask is, are there any taxes due? And next you want to ask is, was there a tax lien certificate issued on the property? And these are the two questions that you want to ask when you call the county, right? That's when you know whether, you know, if the tax are really current, right? That's how, and the next lien position is you, you want to, um, uh, you want to pull a title report. It costs about uh, 80 to 120 bucks, depending upon the vendor. Um, accurate group is, uh, Okay, let me type it in who wants to get this info. the service in all states all the states so you can go to accurate group and uh, the next thing you want to check is the value as i talked about fmv versus upb um, fmv is the fair market value of the property and the upb is the unpaid principal balance so if you're buying a performing loan you want to make sure that the upb is much lower than the fair market value of the property right um, and the uh, next thing that you want to do is uh, if if the UPB versus FMV, uh, it's it's the other way around, or if both of them are same, then you want to buy it at a deeper discount. So what I mean to say is, if the property value is one hundred thousand, eighty thousand dollars is the loan amount, and let's suppose you you get that eighty thousand dollar loan at seventy thousand dollar loan, seventy thousand dollar purchase price. So basically, you got a ten thousand dollar discount on the UPB. If the property itself is worth 80,000 and the UPB is 80,000, you don't want to buy that at 70,000. You probably want to buy it at 55,000 because there's a huge, bigger risk of borrower defaulting when the LTV is higher, right? And the most important thing that you want to do is the collateral is in-house. What does collateral is in-house mean? What that means is the physical copy of the mortgage and note, the original copy that the borrower signed, that whoever has that, um, they become, I mean, not 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 directly, but in, in most cases, whoever has the uh, physical paperwork, the mortgage and note, they become the owner of the note. So you wanna make sure that they do have access to this. So since the note industry has grown a lot, there are a lot and lots and lots of brokers. Uh, who don't have a clue what they're doing, right? Uh, they don't have any, um, you know, collat handle of the physical collateral, which is mortgage and note in their control. They don't have in their, in their possession. So they want to sell you the notes, right? And there are some folks who want to sell me a note, a non-performing note. How about the UPB? Higher than the UPB, uh, right? Um, some people want to buy it. Yeah, more power to them. I'm not going to buy those. Right. Either it's performing or non-performing, I'm never paying higher than what is unpaid principal balance. The interest rate could be great, the equity could be great, I'm still not buying above UPB, right? If you want to be safe, that's what you want to do. 
So once you have the collateral, then comes uh, the due diligence um, on the financial perspective, right? Uh, I told you, uh, you want to make sure that the original principal balance that the borrower is stating is accurately, uh, that is the amount that you have in the um, note. Because when you have a note, the amount borrowed is listed in there. Current principal balance, you get the current principal balance from the servicing records, right? If they have made the payments, you will see what is unpaid principal balance as of today. Interest rate is listed in the note and also in the servicing history. Monthly payment is listed in the note. What is the monthly payment you are receiving? Especially when you're buying repo farming loans, one, one thing that you want to make sure is don't just look at the original note. In most instances, what happens is if a loan has been modified, um, the monthly payment has gone down. So he was paying $1,000 a month. Now wife and husband were paying together. One of the spouse lost the job, so they cannot afford $1,000. They can only afford $700 now. So the payment has went down, has gone down. But if you're just looking at the original note, you would think that the payment is $1,000. Whereas if you look at the payment history, most recent payment history, then you would know it is 750. That's one more reason why you want the payment history from the servicer, not from the seller. Um, and ideally, you should there should be some down payment that the borrowers put down. So basically, that um, that puts that gives you some skin in the game. And one other thing that you want to look at when you're buying a note is uh, if your intent is not to get the property back, is buy an owner-occupied note versus a non-owner-occupied. Owner occupied, uh, generally owners take care of the property much better. They have an emotional connect to the property and they want to upkeep the property and pay the pro you know, property monthly payments and all of that. So you want to make sure that um, uh, whether it's owner occupied or non owner occupied. How do you know that? Go check the tax records of the county. If the mailing address of where the tax bill is being sent and the address of the borrower, both are the same, then it's an owner occupied property.
Can you hear me now? I don't know what's going on today. Maybe it's my internet. Are you able to see my slides? Can you hear me? Yes, OK. All right, um, let's talk about the case study for today. Uh, this was a second lien loan that I bought in uh, May of 2020. Uh, this was a property in Orlando, Florida. Uh, this is a second lien. Uh, the balance of my loan was $47,018.62. The property value was 333600 and uh, the payoff, uh, because they did not make a payment since September of 2014. So uh, the total payoff, which includes all the late fees and um, accrued interest and all of that combined has jumped up to 67,442.75 cents. This did have a senior loan with a balance of uh, 213,427.61 cents. So I had some legal expenses in foreclosing on this property, legal expenses recording everything put together. I had an additional expense of uh, 6,789. Uh, so the fair market equity, how is the fair market equity calculated? The fair market equity is calculated by looking at the fair market value of the property minus the senior lien. So when you subtract 333K minus 213K, the, you know that's the balance that you get. That is a fair market equity. So if I'm buying, a UPB of 47,000 with a fair market equity of 120,000. So a $120,000 equity is protecting my investment that I bought this note. Obviously I'm not going to pay 47,000 for this note because the borrower is not paying. So I actually bought this note for 13,900. And when you uh, include the uh, expenses that I paid in legal costs and other costs, 6,000, so total cost came up to 20,689.92 cents. So um, I started the foreclosure process. Uh, there was a lot of equity. Borrowers generally try to file bankruptcy um, for two reasons. One, one is uh, they want to delay the process. The other reason is uh, they don't have the money to bring up the loan current. Uh, but in most instances, it's bad advice from unscrupulous attorneys or a family friend. It's no intent from a family friend and a family or a friend, right? They just don't know better. They just say, file the bankruptcy, you know, they cannot foreclose on you. That is not true. You need to understand what exactly bankruptcy does. First, it ruins their credit. Other is it doesn't exempt them from paying the loan. They have to pay the loan. Uh, they have to go through certain process. Either they have to lose the house. If they're filing chapter seven, Either they have to lose the house or if they want to stay in the house or keep the house, they have to pay the, you know, pay the mortgage either way. When you file BK-13, uh, there are two separate things. If, the, if there was no equity, we already said that there was $120,000 equity. Even if you were to value the property a little lower, there's no way um, they could actually strip the property. Stripping the property is if the first senior balance is higher than the property value, let's suppose the senior UPB that we talked about over here is more than 300 and, you know, let's suppose it's 350. So we know that this property is underwater. Then what happens is they go to, they file bankruptcy and go to the court and say that I don't have enough equity to actually make this payment. So I do not want to make this payment. Can you strip the second lien? So they have to, there are certain regulations by which uh, the judge will eventually approve that. Yes, uh, the second loan is stripped. What that means is you will not get paid anything. However, once the judgment is given, that's not final. They are also given a payment plan um, wherein they are paying the second lien lender uh, along with all of the creditors for a period of five years, four to five years. And if they complete that repayment plan, which they're paying much lower than what they're owed, but if they complete the five-year plan without missing any payments, then the second lien goes away. But statistics say only about 60% of the people actually complete their plan. Most of the people default before they get to the five-year plan. As long as, as soon as they default, you are again in play. You can start the foreclosure again. 
right? What was strange in this case is um, we were sending all the legal notices and stuff. They did not respond to us. They waited until the sale date came along. Um, the sale date was about 21 days left, and that's when they filed the BK. And generally, when you file BK, uh, generally the what they are trying to say is, I don't have the money to the pay the pay the loan. So surprisingly, as the payment, uh, uh, once they filed the BK, they reached out and they, I gave them option of, you know, five thousand dollars down payment, ten thousand dollars, fifteen thousand dollars down payment. And to my surprise, they chose fifteen thousand down payment. I mean, if they had fifteen thousand dollars. Why did they pay? Why did they go for BK? Because applying for BK is not cheap. They will spend at least $4,500, if not more, to file BK to the attorney and the trustee of the court. So basically what they've done is they already have the money. They put $5,000 down the drain. The payment plan that they agreed to, they could have easily come to me. I would have agreed to $15,000 payment and the payment plan. So they are paying $50,000. They paid $15,000 down. And they are paying 48650 for 24, uh, 20, 240 months, which is 20 years. All right. So they did not gain anything. They just lost $5,000 for no reason. But, um, you know, it's their wish. All right. So once you do this, um, so my my return on this is going to be 38% on, the, on my money. Um, you know, any questions on this uh, case study? That's all I have for today. Rule of when it comes to the statute of limitations and last payment date. Um, so statute of limitations is depend upon the state. Um, so each state has, so is there any particular state that you're referring to or are you asking in general, Louis? Do you want to come online and ask the question? Maybe that might be easier. If you join the stream, I can ask, I can, and join you to the stream and you can ask the question. So if you're not specifically asking about any particular state uh, in general, so what happens is every state is different. So uh, it's not always based on the last payment date uh, where the statute of, uh, it's called toll, the tolling starts. Um, I can give an example, like if you are buying a note in Illinois, if it's a mortgage and a note, not a HELOC, then it's 10 years. 10 years from the last payment date. Is it the case all the time? No, in some states, it is dependent upon when the maturity date has occurred. So in, in uh, Florida, it is five years after the maturity date when the statute of limitation ends. So if it has been more than five years after the maturity date, you cannot collect on that note anymore, right? In some states, it's based on the origination date when the origination was done. So if the origination was done in, uh, before 30 years from today, then you cannot collect on it. It does not depend on the last payment date. Sometimes um, it is not straightforward. That is the answer, right? Uh, it depends on different conditions depending on the state. So if you have any specific state that you would like to know, let me know. I can. Uh, uh, I don't have all the states, but I do have most of the states that I buy in. I buy in about 36 different states. So I have the statute of limitations for those states. So I can provide that in front. It is not straightforward. What I mean by that is in some states, they will let you um, um, progress the last payment date. So it, last payment date, and there are other ways to go around it. So it is not a straightforward standard answer for all states. It differs, it depends. So one of the things that you want to do is when you want to get into the non-performing note space, you want to have a good legal counsel in that state. Whatever state you're buying in, Make sure that you have an attorney, competent attorney in that state that has handled foreclosures in the past. You want to make sure that it's a foreclosure attorney, not a foreclosure defense attorney. Foreclosure defense attorney represents the borrower. Foreclosure attorney represents you. You want somebody who's representing you. Does that answer your question? Okay. If anyone else has any questions, now would be the time to ask your questions. Okay. If you don't have any questions, you know how to get in touch with me. I'll put up my contact info. Uh, I'll keep the slide up for a few more minutes. 
and then um, you know you can contact me over there via my phone or email address or Facebook you can DM me and um, if you don't have any questions you guys have a good evening wherever you are have a good day if you're in the West Coast and uh, see you around in the Facebook group and let me know if I can help you have a good day everyone let me keep this up